Okay, so Josh Waitzkin is an international master in chess, a world champion in Tai Chi, and a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu under Marcelo Garcia. And so when he writes a book about learning, it's probably worth reading. And so I first read this book, The Art of Learning, over a decade ago. But coming back to it recently after getting my black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and like learning a bunch of other stuff, I realized that there was a lot in it that I didn't get the first time. So today we're gonna go over the seven key principles that I think help Josh succeed in all those fields, but that also I think work if you don't care about competitive stuff like sports or chess. Starting with using form to leave form. So a really simple example of this is that in chess, beginners start out by memorizing the values of the different pieces. This kind of helps you understand when it's worth risking a piece or exchanging it for another one or two or three or whatever. After a while, you realize it's a bit more complicated than that. So for instance, bishops get a little bit more valuable in end games. And when you're an expert in chess, Waitzkin says, you don't really think of these numbers at all. And so in sport, this might be more like studying specific techniques until you don't really need to think about how to apply them anymore. So instead of thinking through every step or detail of a punch or a tennis forehand, you can just do the movement quickly and fluidly. At that point, you've kind of left form behind and you can build from that simple concept to more advanced things as your understanding grows. And I really think this applies to almost everything, whether it's competitive or not. So for instance, if you're trying to write a compelling story or script, you might learn the principles of planning out like a narrative with an act one climax, a midpoint and an act two disaster. But after you've followed that structure a few times, it becomes so ingrained into your writing that you don't really have to think about it anymore. So I think it's really important to work at things until you've got a strong foundation of knowledge that you don't actually have to consciously think about too much. And part of doing this is what Josh calls investing in loss. So the most basic way to look at this is if you want to get good at something you need to spend a lot of time being bad at it. And so the way Josh explains this is you should look at loss as an investment rather than something to avoid. So for instance in chess something that a lot of beginners do is study a ton of openings. Obviously the way you start every game. So memory Memorizing a few of them can be an easy way to rack up wins in the early going. But the problem is there are thousands of openings and you can spend so long studying them that you don't have time for anything else. And so eventually the people who get that early advantage find themselves losing more and more and aren't always sure what to do about it. So in chess, it makes sense to invest in loss by learning the principles and strategies that shape the entire game rather than just memorizing a quick few patterns that let you net quick wins. And this happens everywhere. So in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, it's crucial to put yourself in bad positions and try moves that you're bad at so that you can improve your game, even if it means losing in the short term. Or if you're playing piano, you can spend a long time relying on the pedal to make your pieces sound nicer, but that's only gonna affect your playing ability over the long term. So instead of avoiding the areas where you're gonna lose or look bad, it makes sense to focus on them and try and strengthen them over time. And a good way to do that is reduce complexity. So with his first chess teacher, Bruce Pandolfini, Josh used to use a form of practice where they'd start with just two or three pieces on the board, maybe like a king versus a king and pawn, or a queen and a knight against the queen and a bishop. He says this gave him a really strong sense of the way each piece moved around on the board, as well as giving him a knowledge of like higher level principles like tempo and zugzwang. And obviously this works in other places. For instance, fighting game expert Gerald Lee talks about how he's introduced beginners to Street Fighter with a game called Sweep and Throw, which gives them a really firm understanding of how those two movements work without the confusion of the hundred other movements they'll eventually need to know. And this also allows them to compete with and even occasionally win against other much better players, even if it's in a really limited way. So in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, a way to do this is with games where the win conditions are really simple, like breaking a grip or getting to an underhook. But if you're trying to write fiction, reducing complexity might mean working on, say, a short story with just a couple of characters. The basic idea is that you want to give yourself fewer things to worry about, while still practicing the skill in a semi-realistic way. And this also helps when it comes to using adversity. So when Josh was training for the national championships in Tai Chi, he actually broke his hand in a regional tournament during his preparation and ended up having to keep his arm in a cast for several weeks. And the point he makes here is that most people think of injuries as setbacks or things that you have to like recover from or work around. But his point is that you should reframe injuries or obstacles as a way to learn by focusing on an area of improvement that you've otherwise been neglecting. So with his hand in a cast, Waits can learn to use one arm to control both of his opponent's hands for brief moments in the match, which gave him a crucial advantage in important bouts. And he makes the point that NFL players who use injury time to study the mental side of their games often come back and play at a higher level. So this is something I've definitely done this year. I've had a couple of injuries at Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and I've used the time to get deep into watching instructional content and like analyzing my game. But it's also something you can do proactively by setting aside periods to work on your weaker areas without 
without waiting to be like derailed by an injury to do it. This also helps to manage the level of hard work you're putting in over time, which leads us to stress and recovery. So we're probably all kind of familiar with taking rest periods at the gym. You lift a weight for 10 reps or whatever, you take 60 seconds off, then you do it again. You wouldn't try and do all your reps in one go because obviously you wouldn't be able to do that many and it wouldn't be a very efficient use of your training time. If you're working at it properly, there comes a point in your training when 60 seconds is enough for your body to pretty much fully recover and be ready to go again, like whatever movement you're doing. And so Weightskin makes the point that this is something we should be extending to everything we do and learning to relax and recover very quickly in brief moments of inactivity. So he talks about how Michael Jordan would sit on the bench and his brakes like totally letting go and then coming back to the court almost completely fresh. Or the way Pete Tiger Woods looked completely unfazed between shots, just strolling between the holes, focused but relaxed. And so this is something that you can bring to work by using a Pomodoro timer to take five minute breaks between intense bouts of work. But I think something that's really important to appreciate is that you have to do something away from your desk during those breaks. Whether that's doing a few press ups, taking a quick walk, or like checking in with one of your family or a colleague. So something I've been doing, for instance, is leaving my phone behind when it's time to go pick my six-year-old up from school. It's only a short walk, but it basically guarantees me a few minutes of the day when I'm out in a little bit of greenery, not worrying about like work emails or notifications or whatever. And on an even more micro level, you can apply this to stuff like reading. So when you feel your attention start to wander from the page you're on, maybe you briefly put the book down, take a couple of deep breaths and focus before you carry on. And that's all part of the next thing Josh talks about, which is maintaining presence. So a line I really like from the book is, those who excel are those who maximize each moment's creative potential. And what I think Josh means by that is that there are some people who manage to embrace moments in every day with the same sort of concentration and focus that most people only manage when everything's on the line. And that's not easy. It's definitely something I struggle with a lot, and there are still days when I procrastinate before I get into my work, or I find my attention really wandering when I'm supposed to be practicing jiu-jitsu or working on my piano or whatever. So something Josh suggests is what's called building your trigger, which basically means having a routine that allows you to get in the zone for moments that are really important, where that might include some simple exercises or a favorite song or a cup of green tea. And the idea is that you'll eventually be able to scale this routine back to where it just takes a couple of minutes, but you'll still be able to reap the benefits. And the trick is the more you do this, the more that kind of presence becomes kind of second nature until you're fully present in meetings, exams, practice, or when you're hanging out with your family. Because as Waitskin says, everything is always on the line. And so that's the art of learning. And I think the high level principles it explains about learning are super valuable, but they work even better if you combine them with what we've learned since about how we recall and store information in a scientific way. And if you want to learn more about that, check out this video next. Thanks very much for watching.